Hello, everyone. So in this session, I will tell you about the upstreaming of the Rockchip AK3588. But before that, let me introduce myself, because I'm not as well known as Greg, for example. So I'm a kernel engineer at Collabora. I maintain the power supply subsystem. That's the one containing drivers for battery management. Apart from that, I'm a developer uh, for Debian. I'm living in the north of Germany, and there I co-founded the hackerspace, and uh, I'm diving at the fire brigade. Those two points are not that relevant for this talk, but they will be interesting tomorrow for the talk at Embedded Recipes. So let's come to the topic. Um, last year, about this time, I got asked if I could support, uh, if I could help supporting the Rockchip 3588 upstream. And I was wondering, what the heck is that? Let me look it up. Um, so I searched a little bit and found this diagram from Rockchip and thought, whoa, that's a lot of hardware. They seem to buy everything that's available and put it in their system on a chip. Sounds interesting. Let's give it a try. And a few days later, this was on my desk, which looks quite big. Um, so the first steps I tried was just powering it on and see what happens. It came with a pre-installed vendor system. My task was to upstream kernel support, so I thought, great, I will completely ignore any u work and just use the one that's already available, and uh, then try to start as minimal as possible and enable everything step by step. So I had a look at the fortunately available source code from downstream and try to create a minimal device tree based on that. Um, with the idea that the U-Boot already prepared the most important things for me. And I just want to have U-Boot, so, uh, sorry, serial, so that I can see messages from the kernel. So I thought, okay, let's try this. Just describe the serial port and nothing else, and let's give it a try and see what happens. And the result was nothing. Which is obviously not what I wanted. Uh, and then I noticed, well, maybe it was not the greatest idea to not even have like interrupts. Probably the serial controller wants to have them. Um, but fortunately, you would also already prepare the serial device. And you can tell the kernel to please reuse that by giving it the, the correct command lines, which I did. And then I got some messages. So the interesting part here is the early con line. And if you look up what I did, I just gave it the same addresses that are already in the device tree. So not that interesting. And now I get a nice error message. So the most important part is already done. I get error messages, and now I can just like fix those and then get a step further. So it complains about missing timers. Let's add them. So I extended the device tree a little bit and added the timer node. Um, I tried again to be minimal. So well, I had to add the interrupt controller, because timers without interrupts, that's not going to work. But I don't have to describe it fully. I just used the very basics. And then I tried booting that again. And this time I was greeted. At some point with printk, the console got enabled, and then the lock stops, which is, again, not what I wanted. So I had to, again, modify the command line a little bit and keep bootcon enabled, which then looks like this. So great. It boots a little bit further. Now it complains about, I have no idea what you're booting on, what's the cache sizes, and it fails to boot. So yeah, great. Let's add this. It wants to know the CPU information. I have that. Let's add it. Let's see what happens. Um, in this case, I didn't enable all of the CPU parts. Like, I want the kernel to know about the boot CPU. I don't care about all the extra CPU cores. They will need extra regulators, all of that stuff. Let's keep it minimal. And booting that, the kernel boots quite far. As you can see now in the beginning, we are quite a bit further than before, where it was like being killed in, within the first second. And now just complains about a missing boot device, which is quite nice. But now I have a problem, because what should I do for booting? So I had to look what kind of hardware is available on the device. And that's quite a bit, as we've seen in the beginning. Um, so the interesting part is 
what is the least amount of work because first of all I want to get things working to some degree and then I can extend it later. So I went through all the resources. As you can see for two of them I wrote not available because those two they are not actually exposed on the Rockship evaluation board. So they are not even an option. And most of the resources need power domains. As you can see it's basically all of them except for the MMC. So I thought well, that's probably the best idea to have a look for that. But the MMC also needs like uh, resets because it's a little bit quirky on the 3588. So without the resets, it won't work properly. And also the driver wants clocks. And so the driver for the MMC was already upstream from the previous generation. And removing all this clock support so that it relies on u -boot prepared clocks would be more work than trying to get the clock controller enabled. So that was my plan, enabling the clock controller. Then I had a look and noticed, OK, the pin controller is quite easy. And also enabling that might be useful. Um, and then enabling EMMC afterwards with the idea that afterwards, hopefully, the normal console will also work, because then I will have the clocks and the interrupts which I previously removed from the, res uh, from the serial controller node. So next I had a look at the clock controller and it's quite similar to the previous generation but while well, there is quite a bit more of clocks that are a little bit special um, on Rockchip there are clocks which cannot just be like enabled or disabled but instead they need a second clock which also needs to be enabled. And apart from that, so the clock and reset controller, as the name says, uh, also shares all the, the reset information. And the device free maintainer had the feedback that he wants this time to have a, an interface that's a lot different from the previous generations. So the reset IDs are sprinkled all over the chip. So the reset IDs are not in a continuous ID space, instead you have like 1, 3, 5, then a big gap, and then like 20, 30, um, which was exposed exactly like this in the past. But for the new chip, um, the device free maintainers asked to have like a continuous ID space, a virtual ID space that should be mapped. So that had to be added. And the other interesting part is these linked clock gates. Um, so the previous generation already had two or three of them. And what has been done for the previous generation is that this was basically implemented by adding the extra clocks in the device tree. So for example, if the serial controller needs one of those, then the parent, the additional parent that is required would just be also referenced. But this means that you leak some information in device tree that shouldn't be there, and that's like removing this later would break the, the um, device tree API. So this should be avoided. And back then the decision was made, well, it's probably best to just enable them as critical. And then once we have the necessary infrastructure, we will fix it up in the kernel. Um, so this, of course, means that a lot of power is wasted because these clocks will be running all the time. So, of course, this is not what Rockchip wanted, and they implemented it differently in their own kernel. Um, what they did is that well, they invented a new driver that um, just handles a single clock, one of those clocks that needs the enable signal, a parent, and then a second parent, and handle it like a normal clock gate controller. But in addition, using runtime power management, enable the second clock, which is nice because that way the extra clocks will only be enabled when the main clock is needed. But it again means that the device tree is heavily modified. It won't see one clock controller as we have it nowadays for basically all the upstream supported boards, but instead has like 25. And fixing this up later would require changing device tree a lot, which is not an option. Um, so I had to remove all of this and instead mark everything as critical as it has been spoken before and waste all this power. 
And yeah, this is actually how it looks like right now in the kernel. What I did is keeping all the information, like the kernel right now has, it has the knowledge internally, like the compiler would have the knowledge what is required, but we are missing the necessary infrastructure. <coughs> And now just recently, like about four weeks ago, Rockchip has a new suggestion how to handle it. Um, so they again effectively describe everything as a clock gate. Um, but in the enable call to the clock, they in addition enable a second clock. And all the information about which second clock is required is part of the main driver. That one is still pending, but um, it looks good so far. So I guess it will probably be upstream soonish. Then next, I had to look at the pin marks and pin controller stuff. Um, the easiest one was the GPIO controller. It's a newer version. So the upstream kernel had version 2.0 supported. In 3588, there was a 2.1 controller. It has a new ID. I told the upstream driver, yes, there's a new ID. Handle it like the old one. And that's it. Fully supported. So it's um, backward compatible. Um, for pin marks, it's a little bit similar, but the register addresses are sprinkled all over the chip. Um, so a big patch that is needed telling the kernel about all those registers where they are laid out. Um, that's the same for all the previous generations. So it's quite easy to get this upstream. And I think it, I managed to do it in like only three weeks or something. So this one was merged early, but not as early as the EMMC controller because the EMMC, like the, the MMC maintainer, he was really fast. That one got merged, I think, within a week or something. So in 6.4, um, we actually had a regression. Um, at that point, not even everything was upstreamed yet but some person optimized the usage for the previous generation. Um, so the MMC controller has um, support for high speed modes, but those only work if the clock is fast enough. On 3588, that's basically a given because the clock is assigned and also the clock speed are assigned from device tree, but in the previous generation, that's not the case. So the kernel has to choose the right clock and it sometimes shows um, a wrong one, and then the high speed was not enabled, even though it could be enabled if the kernel was aware that it could choose a faster one. So the person added a patch that the driver checks for the fastest speed possible, which on 3588 um, results in a bug in the clock controller. And I initially thought it would be a bug in the rock chip implementation, but it turned out to be a bug in the clock core. So this is a problem for all platforms, which effectively shows the slowest clock possible. And of <coughs> course, if you're checking for the slowest clock possible, that's not fast enough for high speed modes. So that was disabled. Um, being on that, so this is fixed now. Being on that, I found actually a second bug that's still open. Um, the first one only overflows when you are asking for the absolute maximum speed possible, like a full wind 64. The second one will overflow for smaller numbers, but because this person explicitly asked for the biggest one, it still works out. So right now, if you request, uh, let's say, 4.5 gigahertz speed, um, that might result in issues on all 64-bit platforms. Right, so once all of this was solved, I thought, great, Debian boots. Let's send it upstream. Everything else can wait. Um, the idea was that all code written up to this point would look the same even after more hardware is added. So it's perfectly fine to upstream this as a partial device tree. And that way, if somebody else is working on things, um, he can reuse the work that's already done. And also, I avoid that people do the same work in parallel and wasting lots of time. And then once it's sent, we can use pipelining because of course maintainers need some time to review things. So next on my plan was enabling networking because serial is nice, but if you want to copy files, it would be nice to have SSH available. 
Um, so I continued looking into network support. And network is a bit tricky on this platform. So the evaluation board has two network ports. One of them is using a native GMAC. That's one gigabit. It needs uh, power domains. That's why I didn't use it initially for the rootFS. So those two had to be added. And at some point I was, yes, nice, everything is working. Then a colleague of mine got a different board, the Rock 5A, and it's actually using the other GMAC, and that was broken. So we had to fix it up. Great, now that board is also working. But then everyone else that I know received the Rock 5D, and that's quite a bit different because it's using neither the first nor the second internal GMAC of the SOC, and instead it's using a PCI Express network card that's directly on the board, but it's PCI Express based. So PCI Express had to be enabled. And to enable PCI Express, we need better support for in the interrupt controller. Um, in PCI Express, nowadays, interrupts are message based. And on 3588, this translation from the message interrupt to a normal interrupt does not happen in the PCI Express controller, but in the interrupt controller. So I tried enabling that. And well, the kernel doesn't boot anymore just by enabling this feature. The reason for that is that the board has, or the SOC has a floor. Um, the hardware vendor thought it would be enough to connect the chip to the normal AXI bus, which most peripherals are connected to, but that one is not cache coherent. Now that doesn't sound too bad because while well, the message signal interrupt should only be used by PCI Express, one would guess. But once it's there, the kernel is also using it for its own purposes. That's why it will die during early boot. So I had to look, okay, how did Rockchip solve this downstream? And they added all kind of uh, hacks in the interrupt driver so that it detects, okay, I'm running on a 3588. Um, don't share all these registers and avoid them somehow. Then I had a look, okay, how was this solved upstream for the previous generation, which apparently has the same bug. And, well, long story short, it wasn't solved. They just avoid using the interrupt translation service at all. Um, the reason for that is that the upstream maintainer for the interrupt controller, he either wanted to have the driver reworked completely so that this is handled in a generic way which is quite a bit of work and also means that the ACPI standard needs to be changed or to get an errata number from Rockchip, which, well, at that point Rockchip didn't want it to provide. So we had a bit of work to do. Uh, we tried both ways in parallel and at some point, fortunately, Rockchip provided us with an errata number. At at that point, it went quite quickly, so this is supported upstream now, um, at least for 3588. So the previous generation uh, is still still missing. Um, I actually got errata numbers for that too, but I'm currently missing the time and also a chip, like a board with that chip to, to test them out. And additionally, the previous generation is affected by a second bug, so there's still a bit of work to do. But like just a few weeks ago, uh, Lorenzi from Linaro started working on a different system on a chip from a completely different vendor with exactly the same bug. And he decided to go the generic variant. And he now handed in a proposal for the ACPI standard to be changed. So hopefully this will be fixed properly soonish. So what else did I have to do? Um, the 3588 brings a new PMIG um, that's basically exclusive for the 3588, so it's relatively new, and all 3588 boards are using it, either one or two of them. Um, that turned out to be quite complicated because it's kind of a successor of the AK-808, which is, well, the naming's weird, I know, um, with the trouble that it's connected over SPI instead of I2C. So I thought, great, 
We have RegMap for this. The driver is already using it. Perfect. That should go quick. But a lot of subdrivers try to access the I2C client directly. So I effectively had to do changes in all of the subdrivers, which are like five or six, which means the whole patch set needs to wait for all of those maintainers to reply and give the act by. In the end, it took like three kernel cycles for everyone to answer this <coughs> patch set. Um, so I think we definitely should look for a better solution for this kind of work. And then for those chips, uh, for those boards that are using only one of the PMIX, um, they don't have enough voltage rails. So those usually have one, two, or three additional I2C based regulators. Those were also new. Rockstep wrote a new driver for that. But fortunately, a colleague of mine noticed that there's already a driver in the tree. Uh, the Fairchild Fan 53555 one. And that's basically exactly the same. So they re-implemented the chip. So that turned out to be quite easy in the end. A part of this, there are lots of other blocks, and quite a lot of them were really easy to support. Um, I have here a list of well, hardware blocks, which were basically add a compatible string and reuse the existing driver. Um, so not a lot of work in theory and practice. Changing the device tree bindings is always fun. Um, for th some of those, apparently the existing upstream device tree bindings were completely broken, so those had to be fixed. Some of them were just like quite easy. For example, the um, analog digital converter, it's like a really small thing. The driver is quite small. So upstreaming support for this was done quickly. Then we have one more interesting bit, the AV1 codec. Uh, you might remember that the chip has like all kind of codecs. Upstream right now is only support for one of them, which is AV1. The reason for that is we had some people who needed a second reference implementation for AV1 uh, encoders and the kernel, and they chose this hardware. Um, so if anyone is interested in the other codecs, please give it a go. We currently don't have any plans for it. With that, let's have a look at the current kernel status. So most of the basics are supported. Um, you can boot into whatever distribution you want to, and you will have network um, independently on how it was implemented. What you will not have is any graphics. Um, a colleague of mine is currently working on that, but I wouldn't hold my breath. Like um, A lot of changes are required. It's a huge task. Then I have another colleague. She is uh, working on the HDMI input part. Um, that one is interesting because right now we don't have any explicit driver for HDMI input support. Um, I expect that to probably arrive at the end of this year. Me, I'm currently working on USB 3, um, which is like the, the last missing of the basic bits. Then we have the huge thing, the GPU. There's a whole team working on that one in collaboration with ARM. Um, I cannot tell you the current status, um, but there's a, a nice blog post of them, and they are quite busy. One of the issues that they have is that they are currently missing display support, so they cannot see a thing. That's a bit of a problem. So I, we hope that HDMI output uh, will be done soonish. Apart from us, we have Quarantine from Bay Libre. He is working on the crypto part. I've seen a message like last week, I think, that he got it working on 3588 on the upstream one. So I think that will arrive soonish. And we have Sasha Hauer from Pangotronics. He is currently improving perf support for the platform so that it gives statistics for memory usage. Assuming that this will be done at some point, we have some open bits. Um, for graphics, that's DisplayPort and DSi. Then everything related to cameras and video codecs, uh, the random number generator and CAN. So if everyone is interested in that, please give it a go. We currently don't have any plans for that part.
DSI. I think Jagan was showing uh, DSI and CSI and ISP working on main line. I don't know what the status of the code is, but I think he's working on that. Okay. Or I already have it working. I mean, I saw a demo. Great. Right, so that's it for the kernel. I had some more slides about U-Boot. I know we had kernel recipes, but the kernel won't work without U-Boot. So we had some people looking into it. Um, that was quite a bit later, and we only have one of those evaluation boards. So that person started with the Rock 5 b with the idea to get it, first of all, ready so that it works with kernel CI. So for kernel CI, you want to load the kernel over the network. But as you may remember, the Rock 5 b is the board with the network controller that's connected over PCI Express, and that's not supported by the vendor you would. So we thought, ah, oh, well, first of all, we only want to get kernel CI working, so let's plug in a USB Ethernet adapter. USB is working, you can boot from it, so USB Ethernet dongle should also work. Turned out, nope, doesn't work. And we were quite a bit confused about it and tried to figure out why is it not working. Like, USB works, USB dongle works on another board, why is it not working? And it turned out the downstream configuration had config set, Ethernet address set. And the USB Ethernet driver thought, well, great, I will make use of that. So it sent packets with the MAC address that's generated from the serial number from the board. But it expected packets with the MAC address from itself. So nothing worked. So it's quite easy to fix. Just disable the config option or modify the driver to work properly and done. At this point, downstream u boot could be used for kernel CI. And then Egan could continue and have a look at upstream u boot to get everything supported properly. So we had like a four-step plan. First of all, try to add all the, the basics. And while he was looking into that, apparently uh, Keva from Rockchip sent a series adding initial support to U-Boot. And one or two days later, Jagan sent also a series adding also basic support. Um, Rockchip used their vendor tree. Um, Jagan rebased everything on top of the kernel patches that I did. Um, and those effectively have been merged. So Egan had a good starting base. Um, but he got a little surprised, like when he got his U-Boot working based on upstream and booted into the kernel it just crashed. And he was wondering why. Looked into it and figured out that the vendor you boot gets ATEX. That's this very legacy thing that some of the young people may remember from the past. <laughs> so the, the pre U boot bootloader uses ATEX to tell U boot, hey, there are some memory areas and you're not allowed to access them. And then passes this information further to uh, Linux. So after adding those memory gaps in, the, uh, in U-Boot, just hard-coded. Um, everything worked as expected. We still don't know what those memory gaps are for, so we hope that there would be some feedback from Kevra, who's working for Rockstrip, like, what the heck is going on? Why are you hard-coding this? But he just merged it, so, well, maybe we will know at some point. So once that was done, um, of course, with the upstream u boot we had the USB Ethernet solution working. Um, we also wanted to have native Ethernet so that we can get rid of this extra adapter. Um, so Egan looked into it and uh, ported the PCI Express driver from the vendor tree. Um, and then he started looking into what do we need to do to support the network adapter. And he found an old network driver that's from an older chipset, and figured out, well, it only takes like a week to add support for the new chip. Like just basic support, um, but good enough to load a kernel, and that's what we have upstream now. So if you use upstream u boot, you can even use the network interface, and it's definitely good enough to be used for things like kernel CIO for any testing. Right. Um, afterwards, he had a look at all the other hardware that's available. And um, first of all, checked, uh, do we need it in U-Boot, or is it enough to have it in the kernel? Um, so the idea is to support everything that you can boot from. 
and we have most of these done. There's one open issue, which is the USB 3 port that's connected to USB-C. In theory, you can boot over USB-C by booting into device firmware upgrade mode or something similar, um, but that needs gadget support. And adding this to the DVC-3 driver was blocked by the um, U-boot maintainer because he first of all wants to resync the DVC-3 driver against what is available in Linux. Um, that's not something we will do, so if somebody is interested in doing that work, we assume that it's lots of work. Feel free to have a go. It actually isn't a lot of work. It's mechanical. It's purely mechanical. Hey, the synchronization is literally purely mechanical. You just revert some of the commits which have been added over time, then apply the Linux ones, and you're done. So the part that we are worried about is that if you resync the driver, how do we know that all the boards that are already using the driver won't break? You just ask people to test their board. That's how. OK. So effectively, we break lots of boards. I got three platforms I can test on. So I can tell you if those three break. Well, in any case, so right now we, we don't plan to, to continue on that route. We don't have any immediate plans for DFU. So it was more like, well, it's nice to have if it's not a lot of work. It turned out to be more work than expected. So um, the patch is out there. If somebody's interested to continue that pass, feel free to, to have a go. Um, and then, last but not least, we also have the ROC 5A, if you remember. That one has the native Ethernet. So um, that was still missing. Um, I sent a board to Egan so that he could like have a look at adding native Ethernet, and turned out to be a little bit of a problem. And while he was looking into it, you must come and got it working. So yes, that should also work soonish. Um, it received a Revit buy last night, so I suppose we will see it soon. And. That's it from my side, so I'm ready to take questions. Hey, uh, have you considered uh, just using an Initram FS uh, instead of, you know, a peripheral for loading a root file system first? Well, I initially did use an inner drama face for like some testing purposes. Okay. But, um, cool. When I was upstreaming it, like obviously just using an inner drama face is not enough if you want to run a normal distribution. Sure. Yeah, I, w I was wondering because you didn't say that. And yeah, usually it's my strategy. Thank you. Hi, one question. Uh, you, I saw you started with a vendor kernel. Uh, besides that, did you have any documentation? Can you, can you speak a little bit louder? Uh, okay. <clears throat> I noted you started with a vendor kernel, and I was wondering if you had any documentation besides that to, to make the mainlining of the, the work they already did and to make the, the chip work. So initially, I just had the vendor tree. Um, at some point, I got access to the technical reference manual. Um, it turned out that the vendor tree was often more useful than the technical reference manual, to be honest. That was my, my question. Thanks. Okay, so if everyone is, anyone is interested later and has more questions, feel free to come to me. And we do publish the current statu mainline status uh, on some pages. I added some links at the end of my slides, so you can find the slides uploaded later and then follow the links to see the latest status. <laughs>